Hello everyone. It's time for Kingdom Dominion. I'm your host, Michelle Snyder. Thank you for joining me today on this beautiful July summer day. Welcome to my humble abode as we talk about the Word of God today. And we're finishing up a series. We finished up a series last week on Kingdom Living. We could talk about the Kingdom and all the benefits that Christ made available to us forever. It's an endless subject, and I know that I've barely even scratched the surface, but I just sense that the Holy Spirit's telling me it's time to move on to a new topic. So we're going to be talking about the topic of covenant in the next several weeks, and we'll see where it goes. We'll just take it week by week and just let the Holy Spirit tell us whatever we need to know and just encourage us and teach us what uh, we have in covenant. So if you like this channel, please hit that subscribe button down there on the right side of your screen and the bell to get notified every time I post new content and click that thumbs up, encourage other people to watch. So I bless you today. And again, thanks for joining me. Um, so on the topic of covenant, specifically, I'm going to be talking about how covenant gives us access to the things that Christ purchased for us from the spirit realm to the physical realm and what part the covenant that we have in Christ plays in that. So that's the basis of covenant. I know a lot of us have heard many teachings before on covenant, and I, um, I just want to stick to what the Holy Spirit gives me. So, um, so we know that the new covenant was ratified, or formally approved and invested with legal authority. That's what ratified means. The day that um, it was the Last Supper, and Jesus took the symbols of the new covenant with the bread and the wine which resembled or um, was a representation of his body and his blood and we know that in the old covenant that something an animal or something had to give its blood sacrifice its life in order to cover over the sins of the people in the old testament and we know that in the New Testament that our sins were not just covered over. That to atone means to cover over, but Jesus obliterated them. He totally wiped them out and removed sins and all of its effects. So that is one major difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, which the Old Covenant was a covenant made the father god made or god they didn't know him as father in the old testament they only knew him as god or their provider or the many different roles he played in their lives um he made a covenant with israel with abraham isaac jacob and we know that but we as because we're not jewish or um, Hebrew in descent, we weren't under that old covenant. So we know that the covenant, the new covenant that we have in Christ is for all people. The Bible says Jew or Greek or male or female. It doesn't matter um, what nationality or are, any of those things, but we're all one in Christ. We're all accepted into Christ now. So um, it was... The word covenant itself in the Hebrew means to cut. It's a compact or an agreement or covenant between two or more parties. And in the Greek, again, it's a contract, a covenant, a testament, or a will, or a testator, meaning that someone died and whatever he left to his beneficiaries, then they would be able to share in whatever the testator left to them and we know that christ was that testator who left in his will 
all the benefits that he has in the kingdom. Since we talked about kingdom living, all of those things in the covenant that Christ ratified through his blood, not just covering over sins, but totally wiping them out, are ours. The authority that he gave us in his name as sons and daughters. Now the Thayer says that the word covenant is used to denote the close relationship which God entered into with his people. The new covenant binds men to exercise faith in Christ and God promises them grace and salvation eternal. This covenant Christ set up and ratified by undergoing death. So to make a covenant, usually one party is stronger than another and an agreement is made that affects that those families or those parties for generations to come and everything that each party had or has freely belongs to the other parties there's an exchange and an um anything that that one party needs they can ask of the other party and they by agreement have given it would automatically give it without question now the best example in our western culture because we're not really familiar with blood covenants and those kinds of things in our culture like they were or they are in other cultures or were in former cultures marriage is the best example we have in our western culture of a covenant and we know even today that that covenant um, has, is being eroded. Sadly, uh, what God instituted and what God brought together and was to be an example of God and his people, a type of commitment and a type of intimacy with God and his people that he would um, bring all of that he is and give it to us as the weaker party and we would share in those benefits and then he took everything that we have and wiped it away because whatever sin brought into our world was no good. So um, I want to read um, also without getting into graphic detail here, I want to keep this PG. Um, we know that the way God designed marriage to be was supposed to be between one man and one woman. And that covenant was supposed to be, they're both supposed to be virgins. And the night of their marriage, they would consummate the marriage and there would be blood that was shed through that consummation. And that made that covenant sealed so that marriage could never be annulled. And that covenant bound them together until death do they part. So I'm going to pick up here in Ephesians 5, starting in verse 17, and I'll comment as we go. So join with me um, if you want to get a pen and paper and just maybe jot some notes down that the Holy Spirit may jog your memory or understanding about some things. So verse 17 in Ephesians 5 and I'm reading from the New King James. It says, Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, I just wanted to comment on that word will. In this part, we're not talking about a person passing away and leaving um, his um, treasures as to beneficiaries. We're, the word will in this scripture in Ephesians 5.17 is number 2307 in the Greek, and it means determined purpose. And the reason why I'm specifically honing in on this word is because we casually throw around the word, well, if it's the will of God, then this will happen. If it's the will of God, then I'll be healed. And if it's not the will of God, I won't. And if it's the will of God, then I'll just pass on into glory. And no, that is not what true biblical will is in the word of God. In God's word, 
the word will means determined purpose. And this word will in 2307 is also related to Matthew. Um, it's in Matthew 8 when the leper, in the beginning of the chapter, the leper comes to Jesus and he falls down on his feet and he says, if, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus says, I am willing, be clean. This is the, a form of that word, the word will and the word I am willing. They're uh, forms of the same word. And what Jesus was saying when he says, I am willing, means that he was resolved or determined that it was his purpose, his desire, and in his nature to do to heal this man. It's who he is. It's in his nature to heal. So when we're talking about here in verse 17, do not be unwise, but understand what God's determined purpose is. Verse 18, do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation or means recklessness, but be filled with the Spirit. It is God's determined purpose for you and me to be filled with the Spirit. And that word to be filled means inebriated with the Holy Spirit, abundantly supplied, satiated, gorged, imbued, and complete. The same in Philippians, in Philippians 4, 19, where it says, My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That word supply is the same word here as filled. So it is God's determined purpose for you to be filled, inebriated, or drunk on the Holy Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. This is also God's will or determined purpose for us. Giving thanks always for all things to God, for the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Now this verse 21 where it says, submitting to one another in the fear of God, I believe should have been joined to verse 22 where whoever these scholars th thought they were, split that up and started talking about wives and husbands. But, and then a lot of people will segregate that from what it said previously in verse 21 and the verses above, that it's God's determined purpose to, for us to be filled with the Spirit and submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. So this verse 21, I want to draw in conjunction with verse 22 and the verses that I'm going to read that follow. Because a wife isn't only supposed to submit to her husband, but a husband is also to submit to the wife, not in a domineering power struggle kind of way. It says submitting to one another in the fear of God. So we're doing it as unto the Lord, not um, the way we see a lot of things going on in marriages today. That's not God's determined plan or purpose. Now, submitting to one another in the fear of God, wives submit to your own husbands, not other people's husbands, your own husband as to the Lord. And these, this is an example. Paul, who was never married, has a revelation of marriage. You know, the revelations that Paul had as an apostle called of God were even um, greater what he conveyed to us through what he wrote in the epistles to the early church. What he conveyed to them was so much more um, applicable and full of understanding um, and dispelling a lot of mystery and myth that had surrounded um, the law and things like that until Christ came. Paul had such a revelation of these things where people who were the original 12 disciples or apostles hadn't, they didn't even write um, such revelations other than first and second Peter and maybe James. But um, so here is Paul who was never married. Peter, we know, was married. Probably most of the other disciples 
were married. But here's Paul giving a revelation of a marriage covenant between a husband and a wife, which he's never partaken of himself, but he is relating the relationship of marriage with Christ and the church. And this is where we're picking up. So wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. So as a wife and a husband relate to each other in their marriage, it's the same way that Christ is the head of the church. Paul is making this point to help us to focus on church, the church and his relationship with the church and the sacrifice that Christ made for his body. And he's using the example of the marriage covenant to do it. So therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be subject to their own husbands in everything. Now, I know that that doesn't mean abusively because we're talking here about Christ and the church and Christ does not abuse his body. He, he sacrificed his life for his body. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. So Jesus loved the church or his body, which is the church, as his own body. And he sacrificed his own body for the sake of the church. And he washed his body with his word because he is the word. And he made the church a partaker of his divine purpose and nature, as we shared earlier. Christ loved the church so much that he was willing to suffer and die for it. His actions not only saved the church, but they also sanctified it. In other words, Jesus wanted to develop the church into what it should be, the holy temple of God. So, Let's go on here in verse 28. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. So Christ nourishes and cherishes his body, us, the church, as a husband who would care for his own wife as he would his own body. For we are members of his body, Jesus's body, of his flesh, of Jesus's flesh, and of his bones. And I love the way that they give, um, Paul is giving this analogy that we are members of his body. This, this brings a the idea of what was accomplished in the spirit realm, what Christ did in the physical was transformed Transferred to us what Christ did in the spiritual was transferred to us in the physical not only what did Jesus do um, not only what he did was it a physical act but we know that it had spiritual and eternal impact and we're talking about here how those things that were done in the spirit and also in the physical how they impact each other and how the spirit realm and the physical realm coexist that we cannot have the physical realm without the spiritual realm because it is the spiritual realm that created the physical and the act of christ's blood ratifying it was a physical act but it had spiritual impact and spiritual ramifications so that christ was able to pay for or atone or redeem the entire man, the entire man, spirit, soul, and body. So we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. 
And Paul goes on to say, this is a great mystery. It's a mystery of how two people can get married and become one flesh. So that when God looks at them, he sees them as one. Did you ever seen a marriage ceremony where the husband and, and the, the groom and the bride, they both have a candle and they walk up to one candle and they light the flame together, signifying that there's two separate people with two separate lights, but now united together in one light, recognized by God as one and recognized by the world as one because the wife takes on the husband's name and they build a family. So they are the their offspring is one of their flesh together. And that's how we are in as children of God that we are one flesh in him because there was a a ratification or a marriage that has taken place where in this covenant that we have in Christ all of the things that are in the heavens or in the spirit realm and in the physical realm have been united into one in Christ. He represents us fully as a man because when Christ died, he died as a man, but he was fully man and he was fully God at the same time because he represented the Father to us but he represents us to the Father. So in doing that, when Christ came, you know, I had this um, conversation with the Lord one day, and I was like, Lord, you, I bet when you finished, you know, all the suffering that you did for humanity and you were received back into glory, I bet you couldn't wait to get out of this crappy place and just be reclothed with glory. And you know what he said to me? He said, Michelle, that never entered my mind. It never entered my mind. I couldn't wait to be reclothed with glory so that I could get my glory back into you. And I, I was, that just brought tears to my eyes and it still does to think that Jesus wasn't God in heaven and then he just came as a man and then went back to being God. His representation of us was forever changed he never just became who he was before the cross again he fully represents us as man in heaven at the right hand of the father and it's a beautiful thing that he is a man in heaven and we will be clothed with the same kind of glory that he is clothed with right now but we also have that glory now. It affects us in the physical. And so when Paul says that the two shall become one flesh, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So Paul is saying this mystery of Christ and the church, the two becoming bone of bone and flesh of flesh and blood of blood is something that Christ accomplished in the spiritual, but made it available also in the physical. And also not just for someday when we die and go to heaven and be in the sweet by and by. It is for now. When you came into Christ, you entered into eternity. And this life that we live is now one in Christ where this union of all that is in Christ fully God yet fully man is now represented in us here on the earth. So these are the things that we're going to be um, addressing in the days ahead and just have a lot of fun and looking at this example of this mystery that Paul talks about, that being bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. If you're bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh and his divine nature is in you and his divine will and purpose is in you, then it is God's determined purpose for you to be inebriated with the spirit and walking in all of those things that we had talked about earlier, um, being filled with the spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, melody in your heart, having joy in your heart, giving thanks always to the Lord 
to God the Father in the name of Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God, doing this as unto the Lord. And everything that we do in our relationship with each other is based on this relationship that we have in Jesus Christ. So I hope that you were blessed by this teaching today. I thank you for joining me. I speak health and life to your body because you truly are bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, nature of his nature, and blood of his blood. It is having an effect on your physical body. And what we want to do is see more of that, be living in the fullness of that and the fullness of Christ in our spirit, soul, and body, a whole man. So I just release wholeness to you, wholeness to your mind, anyone who's battling grief or depression, I command that depression to leave because Jesus restored your soul. So if anyone is also suffering with pain in their body, inflammation in their body, I command inflammation to leave your body in the name of Jesus, that you would recognize Christ in you, the hope of glory. Well, God bless you till next time. And remember that God is with you. God is for you. And God is in you. Amen.